from the top rope, and the Great American Bash, I bid you all good evening, morning, afternoon, wherever you may be in this great land of ours or around the world. Welcome to the $55 million studio on the Pro Wrestle Machine. Whether you're a longtime fan reliving these monumental events or a newcomer eager to understand wrestling's rich history, you're in the right place. This episode is packed with insights, opinions, and a few surprises along the way. Through the use of the Pro Wrestle Machine, Terry Gordy. July 23, 2001. Few details are available in the death of Terry Bam Bam Gordy, a man who was considered the best big man in the sport before a series of drug overdoses ruined a promising career in his prime. Gordy was found dead by his girlfriend at his home in Rossville, Georgia, near Chattanooga, on the morning on July 16 from a heart attack. One of the 1980s biggest stars, had it not been for his career at the top ending at the age of 32 so abruptly Gordy would have been a sure Hall of Famer, and considered right at the top of any list of the best working big men in the history of the business. He was only 40 at the time of his death. The cause of the heart attack was not released pending an autopsy. Gordy, best known in the United States for his days with the Freebirds, but also had a second more lucrative career as one of the main event regulars spanning two glory eras over a 10-year period for all Japan pro wrestling, from the era of the Funks and Bruiser Brody, to the Jumbo Tsurida and Tenryu era. And finally, being one of the two top foreign wrestlers in Japan when Mitsuharu Misawa, Kenta Kobashi and Toshiaki Kawada elevated in ring wrestling to new levels. He becomes the latest unfortunate statistic of the glory days of world-class championship wrestling in the 1983-1985 period, when the company, built around a core of wrestlers in their early 20s and with television featuring the highest production values ever seen in this country, the company in many ways was the innovators of a form of television wrestling, airing the main event matches on television, pioneering entrance music and music videos, which some of the regional companies had done, but with much lower production values, concepts later taken by the World Wrestling Federation in their national boom period. But looking back at that era of world-class wrestling reveals a staggering body count, largely due to out-of-control drug problems and the inability of wrestlers thrust into the spotlight at such a young age to be able to cope with its pressures. Four Von Erichs, three suicides, all in some form tied to drugs, and another drug overdose, Gino Hernandez, cocaine overdose, Bruiser Brody, murdered in Puerto Rico, Scott Irwin, brain cancer, ring announcer Ralph Pulley, AIDS, Jeep Swenson, cancer from years of steroid abuse, Rick Rude, drug overdose, Buzz Sawyer, cocaine overdose, not to mention the near misses like Kevin Von Erich or others from that region who battled demons and ended up losing promising careers over them such as Chris Adams, Jake Roberts, Matt Bourne and many others. In most cases, Brody, Irwin and Pulley being the exceptions, it was people thrust into celebrity status where their excesses were overlooked because of how big business was. Friends in Japan, where Gordy did most of his wrestling in recent years living off his all-Japan fame, were saddened but not necessarily surprised by the news. Gordy who was 6 foot 3 and a half and 285 pounds, born April 27, 1961, started his career at 14, lying about his age, under the name Terry Mecca in 1975. He was a superstar in the industry while still a teenager as one of the true prodigies in the history of the business. He was the in-ring workhorse of the fabulous Freebirds, one of the most historically important and innovative tag teams in history, with partner Michael Hayes, Michael Zeitz, and later buddy Roberts, Dale Hay. Gordy and Hayes hooked up while both were teenagers in 1977, coming out to the ring to the Leonard Skinner classic Freebird. While not the first wrestlers to use entrance music, it was through their appearances on Georgia Championship Wrestling in 1980 that popularized it nationwide and led to it being a staple in the industry today. Hayes' gift of gab, nicknaming him Bam Bam after the child Superman character in the Flintstones cartoon, combined with Gordy's already great in-ring ability made them headliners from the start. They gained their first recognition out of Chattanooga and Nashville for Nick Gulas. Wrestling news didn't travel much in those days, so the two were basically unknowns in the industry, despite already having something of a track record for popping the territory, when they went to work for Bill Watts Mid-South Wrestling in 1979. After Roberts joined the group, and at that point it was mainly Gordy and Roberts, a very well-respected ring general who had already been part of one of the 70s most famous teams, the original Hollywood Blondes with Jerry Brown, as the team and Hayes as the manager, feuding with the likes of Junkyard Dog, Watson Buck Robley in 1979 and 80, they drew record crowds in every city including at the age of 18, headlining a show at the New Orleans Superdome that drew nearly 30,000 fans. 
when they showed up in late 1980 on Georgia Championship Wrestling on WTCG, later TBS, and worked with all the top tag teams in the area, they quickly became the hottest tag team in the country. After a storyline breakup with Hayes, he started teaming with Jimmy Snuka, and with two incredible workers in their prime, they formed the best tag team in the business. Gordy and Hayes got back together while wrestling in Alabama, and had a record run as heels in Dallas, feuding with the Von Erichs after Gordy slammed the cage door on Kerry Von Erich's head in the December 25, 1982 match at Reunion Arena in Dallas when Von Erich was challenging NWA champion Ric Flair in a cage match that was the first $100,000 gate in the history of Texas wrestling. Freebirds vs. Von Erichs led to the hottest two-year period in the history of Texas wrestling and it generally regarded as one of the greatest pro wrestling feuds of all time. He was one of the headliners during a period when the Friday night shows at the 4,000-seat Sportatorium sold out nearly every week for about an 18-month period, while the bigger events at 18,000-seat Reunion Arena were also consistent advanced sellouts, peaking with a famous Texas Stadium show on May 5, 1984. By this point Gordy was a consensus top 10 in the world worker and an international superstar, already ranking with Stan Hansen and Bruiser Brody as the three men almost universally acknowledged at the time to be the three most talented big men in the game. Gordy, more than 10 years younger than the other two was considered the rightful heir to the throne as pro wrestling's best big man and top brawler. He was actually the best worker of the three and the only one of the three considered to be a legitimate NWA World Heavyweight Championship prospect. While not the first man to use the powerbomb, he popularized the move in the 80s, using it for many years before the Japanese named it, and it became one of the most popular finishers of the 90s. In a strange irony his death occurred 13 years to the day of the fatal stabbing of Brody, who he had classic brawls with in Texas, in Puerto Rico. Brody's first big break overseas was being booked in what was all Japan's biggest match in several years, on August 31, 1983 at Budokan Hall, Gordy was picked to be Hansen's partner in Terry Funk's original retirement match, largely to avoid either Hansen or Brody having to do a job, with Dory as his partner. Even though he was in there for the happy ending finish of Terry Funk scoring a pin, just being in such a high-profile match that drew such a huge television rating set Gordy up for a lucrative career in the Orient. His success in Japan, where he eventually became a full-time regular, broke up the Freebird team, but not until after another strong run working for Watts. One month after his 25th birthday, he became the first UWF world champion at a time when it was generally considered the number three belt in the United States. It is likely that very few men in the history of pro wrestling, and probably none in the last quarter century, perhaps an argument can be made for Satoru Sayama, who was already something of a legend for his ring work in three different wrestling universes by the age of 25 although he had nowhere close to Gordy's longevity as a headliner by that point ever achieved so much success in so many different places and had as many years as a headliner in every territory they worked at that age. But there is the flip side of that success. Gordy grew up in the Chattanooga area, poor and uneducated. He was a physical freak when it came to his innate abilities at this profession, something of a much larger version of a Ray Stevens. A guy who never had to train, and for that matter never had to sleep, and he rarely did either, to go into the ring and put on an excellent match. His partying was out of control. Unfortunately, like the natural athlete who is so far ahead of his peers that he's a high school All-American without having to try, not learning the work habits ends up leading to someone who peaks early and burns out. Even without the overdose, Gordy likely would have fit that description and would have been plagued by injuries caused by being in poor condition most likely by his late 30s due to the lack of training and partying. From a maturity level, he wasn't ready for either the huge fame being a headliner in some places like Japan, Dallas and Mid-South, where wrestling was incredibly popular on television, not to mention the relatively big money that went with it. Stories of his drinking were legendary, and that was hardly his only vice. The Freebirds lived their gimmick. In Japan he was one of the key people in a company which raised the level of work rate substantially, and resulted in terrible painkiller problems for many of the men that were part of that period to cope with the flip side of those incredible matches. After the death of Brody, and Ted DiBiase's WWF signing, Gordy became Hansen's regular tag team partner as the dominant team in Japanese wrestling. When booking plans switched with the idea of putting together something of a dream team of Hansen and Genichiro Tenryu, at the time the most popular foreign wrestler teaming with the most popular Japanese wrestler, it left Gordy without a partner. A deal was made between All Japan and New Japan where New Japan allowed one of its top foreign stars, Steve Williams, Gordy's former hot rival in Mid-South, to switch allegiances. Baba paired Gordy and Williams in 1990, and they became one of the most famous foreign tag teams in the country's history. 
they held the double world tag team titles five times before a drug overdose on a flight going to Japan in 1993 left Gordy in a coma for five days, and for the second time clinically dead for a few moments. He had a previous major overdose that left him momentarily dead in the summer of 1990, while at the time holding the Triple Crown title and being on the verge of surpassing Hansen as the biggest foreign star in the country. This first overdose, which nearly cost him his job, came just a few months after what would have been the highest profile match of his career, a Tokyo Dome main event on April 13, 1990 against Hulk Hogan before 53,742 fans for the first, last and only combination show between the three biggest wrestling companies in the world at the time, the All Japan WWF New Japan Wrestling Summit. As it turned out, the match never took place. Gordy refused to do the job, and Hansen, who agreed to put Hogan over clean, volunteered to take his place. Three months later, while partying in the Roppongi section of Tokyo, downing the sake, beer and everything else, he collapsed. He came back from that scare and his career continued to flourish even though injuries in particular bad knees that he never took the time off to fix, started to take their toll. He also didn't change his lifestyle. He survived his second near death three years later. But after that both in and out of the ring wasn't ever the same person. Numerous promoters hoped against hope that Gordy would somehow be able to come back, that his innate ring ability would resurface. But the coma left with him fairly severe brain damage. Smaller Japanese indies would still bring him in from time to time because his name was so strong for the next several years. ECW used him, and one night at the ECW arena, Raven carried him so well in an ECW title match in 1996, that the legend of that match was that he had made a remarkable comeback. Based on that word WWF signed him up, hoping somehow for the miracle that the Raven match wasn't a fluke. In late 1996 when he was brought in as Mankind's tag team partner, the masked executioner, for a proposed angle against The Undertaker. But there was no miracle, and he only lasted a few months in the role, which was his last shot with a major promotion. Gordy was largely unknown to current fans since his heyday has long passed. His last somewhat high-profile match took place on June 9 at the Southeastern Championship Wrestling Reunion Show in Birmingham against Lord Humongous, Jeff Van Camp, and was scheduled for the return date next month. His last match in Japan was on February 4 at Yokohama Bunka Gym for the IWA promotion that he had wrestled in off and on since being let go by Giant Baba. Ironically in recent weeks, he had aired on Japanese television, as clips of Mitsuharu Misawa, who he was the major foreign rival of in the early 90s, visiting him aired. Misawa was there to scout his oldest son, Ray, who has done a little bit of wrestling, and is expected to debut with pro wrestling Noah later this year. Just six days before his death, he was backstage at the WWF SmackDown tapings in Birmingham, visiting with people like Hayes, Jim Ross, Jerry Briscoe and others, and he seemed as clear-headed as anyone had remembered him since before the overdose. Noah was scheduled for a tribute to Gordy on July 18th, the IWA scheduled a tribute on July 20th, and it is expected all Japan will on August 26th. We'll have a more complete career rundown of Gordy in next week's Observer. July 30, 2001 if there are lessons to be learned of the tragic life of Terry Gordy, it may be the typical lessons hammered home so many times in this industry. Too much partying works against you in the long run, even when you have a natural aptitude for the industry. The so-called naturals often peak young and don't have the staying power because the things that keep you close to your peak into your 30s requires discipline. Those that have a lot of success quickly often don't learn that discipline. Not taking care of injuries, even when the injury seems to come at an opportune time, affects one's career and more often than not, their long-term financial livelihood at the other end. While we marvel at just how talented Gordy really was, main eventing the Superdome at the age of 18 and a national television star a year later, there is some question about an industry where someone has their first pro match at 13 and is on the road working full-time in a major promotion before the age of 16. Gordy was almost like the old story of the major league phenoms of old, in the majors at 15, and so few of them ever reached the potential predicted of them, Maybe Gordy, who was a top 10 wrestler in the world for many years, came closer to his full potential than those baseball prodigies of old. Gordy passed away at the age of 40 on July 16, a heart attack caused by a blood clot in the heart at his home in Soddy, Daisy, Tennessee, near the Tennessee-Georgia border, and Rossville, Georgia, the town he grew up in as the local celebrity. He had been complaining of chest pains for a few weeks, and had told people two days earlier that his chest was really tight, but he attributed it to being at the gym and working chest on July 13. His lasting legacy in wrestling seems to be that no heavyweight wrestler of the modern era was as good in the ring so young and had so much success at an early age in so many different places. 
at his peak he was among the best workers of the near 300 pounders ever in pro wrestling. Although his biggest money years working for All Japan followed Gordy's career in the ring seemed to peak at the age of 25. At that point he held the Universal Wrestling Federation Championship, the world title of the number three promotion in the country, headed by Bill Watts. He was the in-ring cornerstone of the fabulous Freebirds, perhaps the most charismatic trio in pro wrestling history. It was during that period that he blew out his knee, the first of many knee injuries he was to suffer. Because he was world champion and because of the nature of the business in those days, rather than take off the six months it would have required to fix the knee ligament problems, he bandaged it up, and kept working hard night after night, in title matches that on occasion lasted as long as one hour. Although he remained a top performer, and he never fully recovered and remained a weakness for the rest of his career. This led to subsequent knee injuries, which worsened due to the physical demands of the All Japan style, which at the time was the toughest in the world. Gordy was always in Japan a key part of the main event mix, generally considered the most talented of the big foreigners even though Stan Hansen, by then past his prime, remained the big gun. But it was Gordy who was called on to work so many big matches for the company, as people like Mitsuharu Misawa, Kenna Kobashi, Akira Tawe and Toshiaki Kawada were elevating themselves to superstardom and Jun Akiyama was starting to get noticed, which was one of the hottest period in the history of the promotion. Whether those injuries led to an increased reliance on pain pills is hard to say. They certainly weren't a deterrent. But Gordy was a heavy partier and a wildman, at times outside the ring, long before injuries. Lots of people have to bump it up, their personalities, for television, said Michael Hayes, now 42 who called the dealing with the death of his longtime best friend this past week, because it was so sudden and unexpected, the biggest challenge of his life. We had to tone it down. We probably owe a lot of apologies to a lot of people. We were taught that in pro wrestling, you live your gimmick. I'm really proud of what we accomplished because it's something they can never take away from us, he said. You wouldn't believe how much trouble we had as teenagers in a man's business. Gordy was the kind of guy those in wrestling would tell wild stories about, but in a nice way. He didn't seem to be a bad guy, but he grew up and achieved fame probably too young to handle it. He got caught up in a world that led him to tragedy, much like so many others of his age and environment, when wrestling caught fire in Dallas. Many stories told of times where Gordy would party too much, get wildly out of control, wound up the next day with Gordy not remembering much about it, and sheepishly apologizing for whatever disturbances he caused that he couldn't remember. There was one story that made the papers in Dallas when, arrested for being intoxicated in public. It took several officers to subdue him, and even when they finally handcuffed him, he had butted the headlight out and with his head, dented up the police car. The next day when he woke up, he was calm, apologetic and signing autographs for everyone at the jail. Ted DiBiase, now 47, who career intertwined with Gordy in the Mid-South, Georgia and Japan, remembered an incident in the Orient when he and Gordy were invited over to dinner by a wealthy pearl dealer who was a big fan and known for being well-connected with merchants who were known for giving the boys good deals. Both being familiar with Japanese customs by this point, they understood the honor of a Japanese inviting them to their house and were on their best behavior. Gordy kept himself from drinking, but the host, who knew Gordy's fondness for Jack Daniels, gave him a bottle as a present. The more Gordy drank, the wilder he became. Before DiBiase had to apologize, telling the host that they've got to get out before this wild bull destroys the home, and call it an early evening to take Gordy back. On the trip back Gordy who passed out in the cab, would wake up and get out of control, with DiBiase continually trying to keep him under wraps until they finally got to the hotel. Once they got to the hotel, DiBiase had to put Gordy in a baggage cart and wheel him up to his room because he was totally out. As DiBiase grabbed Gordy's key to open the door, Gordy awoke, hit DiBiase in the back as he was putting the key in the door, and the key broke in the door. But there was a hilarious scene of three Japanese hotel employees with tweezers and flashlights trying to get the broken part of the key out of the door, before they gave up in despair and just deposited Gordy in a vacant room. At 1 p.m. the next day, D.B. Assey got a phone call. It was Gordy, asking Ted, did I f*** up really bad last night? Pretty bad, Terry. Because I woke up and my room looked different and all my clothes are gone. I didn't know where I was. But he had a heart of gold, DiBiase recalled, he was a lot like Kerry Von Eric in that way. DiBiase, who is really saddened because he was speaking in Chattanooga, where Gordy lived, the day before he died. He had lost touch with him, since he noted it's hard to keep in contact with his old wrestling friends who are constantly changing phone numbers, and didn't call or see him. 
it recalled so many things about Gordy, from the time he first met him when Gordy was only 18 years old and showed up with Hayes in the Mid-South Territory, and they set it on fire with their feud with the junkyard dog and partners like DiBiase, Bill Watts, and Buck Robley. Like most who remember the Freebirds from the beginning, there was Hayes, one of the great talkers of all time and one of the great heels of the modern era, but not exactly a wrestler that opponents relished working with. Retired from the ring and an announcer with the WWF, the glory days of the Freebirds are ancient history for many in such a fast-moving profession. Hayes had a vaunted worked punch, which looked great, because some would tell you it wasn't much of a work, and in those days a lot of wrestlers hated to work with him. Gordy who was one of the great workers even as a teenager, was the one carrying the match, almost a southern version of the Adrian Adonis and Jesse Ventura team which was on top in the AWA at about the same time. They set attendance records throughout Watts territory and were the heels responsible for making Junkyard Dog the all-time biggest draw the state of Louisiana ever had. They hooked up with Buddy Roberts, who is now living near Chicago and needing a voice box to talk after a long bout with throat cancer. Roberts came in as a single, and Watts put them together because while Gordy and Hayes were drawing money, they were very green in other ways. Roberts was an experienced star who was part of one of the 70s best tag teams, the Hollywood Blondes, with partner Jerry Brown and manager Sir Oliver Humperdinck. Roberts' career had sputtered as a single after a gimmick in Texas as Dale Valentine, the supposed younger brother of Johnny, as an excuse for Johnny, then crippled, to work ringside as his manager. Since some of the wrestlers didn't like working with Hayes at the time, Watts had the idea it would create even more heat if Hayes did the all the talking, and acted like a manager. With the heat being Hayes was hiding behind the veteran wrestler and the huge prodigy. They created the idea of the three-man team, a staple of Mexican wrestling but pretty much unheard of in the U.S. by the time they got to Georgia in late 1980 and won the Georgia, which later became the national, tag team titles. The idea was that any two of the three could defend it. Watts, a stickler for credibility, didn't go for that concept, but that became their trademark when they hit Atlanta and became national superstars on TBS. We had to be frustrating to Buck Robley, the booker at the time for Watts, Hayes recalled. We were very green, but we were drawing. He thought Buddy could teach us. Gordy and Hayes were against the idea of adding Roberts to the act when Watts suggested it to them. Hayes told Watts, What if I don't want to do that? Watts responded immediately, Are you guys giving me your notice? Gordy and Hayes first thought of Roberts as a veteran office stooge, but on a trip from Jackson, Mississippi to Shreveport, Louisiana, after shaving cream and pissing on each other, literally, as the Freebirds in that era were known for giving people they liked and sometimes didn't like as well golden showers, for 220 miles, Roberts was officially a free bird for life, even if Hayes and Gordy at that time thought it was only temporary. Word in wrestling traveled much slower, in fact, didn't travel hardly at all in those days. The Freebirds could have been doing big business in Louisiana, but nobody outside the territory would know. Dusty Rhodes and Ole Anderson were booked for a major show, and on seeing them, Ole asked them to come to Atlanta. Gordy actually had his first pro wrestling match at the age of 13 at the RIP television studio in Rossville, Georgia, his hometown, teaming with Eddie Griffin as a tag team called the Masked Scavengers. As a huge kid, he was already a star in baseball and football, but didn't pursue sports as he dropped out of school in the ninth grade to pursue pro wrestling. Even as a freshman, the combination of his size and speed already made college coaches salivate. His wrestling career was apparently guided by his uncle known as Hook, because he only had one arm. His uncle told his high school football coach, Lynn Murdoch of Rossville High, that Terry wasn't coming back to school for his sophomore year. The uncle, lured by the prospects of him as a pro wrestling, told Murdoch that in one year, he'd make more than the coach and within two years would be making $100,000 per year. At the time that sounded ridiculous. He was Terry Mecca, working for Angelo Poffo's ICW with the likes of Randy Savage and Lenny Poffo at 14. There was no money there, but it did pay off later. He was already working main event programs by his 16th birthday, working as the top babyface and holding the Mississippi title for Gil and George Culkin in 1977 and 1978, who were running opposition to Bill Watts at the time. He left the territory for Memphis the first time after losing a hair match and came to Memphis for a few weeks. Those who remember 15-year-old Gordy showing up in Memphis described him as a 260-pound kid, with a short crew cut from losing the hair match, with two left feet, contrary to legend of him always being a great worker. He met Michael Zeitz, who was wrestling in Alabama under the name Lord Michael Hayes in Mississippi, and they worked in Alabama and Mississippi as a tag team. While in Alabama, he was among a bunch of wrestlers in the promotion, some of whom would go on to pretty decent stardom including Ricky and Robert Gibson, 
David Schultz and Dennis Condry to get work for Al Zink in Nova Scotia. By the time he met Zeitz, he was already a good worker and was the darling of the booker, Frankie Kane, better known as the great Mephisto. Gordy was the top face while Hayes was a heel and in those days, because of kayfabe, they had to sneak around to hang out together in private. When I met him, I told him, you'll make it for sure, and somehow, I'm gonna make it. But if we get together, we'll make it that much quicker, Hayes recalled. Hayes then 18, went to Germany on a tour with the Samoans, and came back and convinced Kane to turn Gordy Hill and put them together as a tag team. Kane was against the idea at first, because the idea for tag teams had usually been two similar style performers with similar looks, and they didn't fit the bill. But when business picked up with them as the top heels, he went with it until a night in Natchez, Mississippi where the house was up significantly, and Hayes, seeing just a $50 payoff, confronted the office, and got a, you don't like it, then leave, response. Hayes walked out the door. Then in the car, realizing what he'd done, thought he had just screwed up his career. Sitting in the car, contemplating his next move, he was shocked, a few minutes later, when Gordy came into the car. His first words were, where are we going? As he had just gone to the promoters and told them if Hayes left, he was leaving with him. By 1978, Hayes, now known as Pretty Boy Michael Hayes, became full-time tag partners with Gordy working for Nick Gulas out of Nashville, feuding with Gulas territory killing son, George, and the great worker to carry him named Bobby Eaton. By this time Gordy was already a polished worker. It was there that Hayes first suggested the idea of coming to the ring to the song Free Bird, which is what the two will always be remembered for. Hayes said he actually first came up with the idea at the age of 14, when he was working putting rings up in Pensacola and going to Southern Rock concerts and would see some of the same faces at both shows and thought the marriage of the two would be a great idea. He went to Gula's and Booker Tom Renisto, after it took him a year to convince Gordy to go for it, with the idea of dimming the house lights, putting the spotlight on them like what he'd seen at rock concerts, and then coming to the ring to the song Freebird. E. Gulas looked at Tom Renisto Sr. and told him, I think those boys are taking them marijuana pills again, Hayes recalled. After leaving that territory and going to Memphis, Jerry Jarrett was the first promoter to allow Hayes to see his vision and the fabulous Freebirds were born in 1978, when they showed up in Memphis, for a three-month run. Their debut coincided with the Wrestling Fans International Association Convention, a group of what would have been the forerunner hardcore fans who came from around the country once a year to meet. From that group included such people as the late Brian Hildebrand, Jim Cornette, Eddie Gilbert and Paul Heyman. Although Heyman may not have been at this specific convention, the latter three of whom ended up being major players in the industry behind the scenes. He pretty much shocked everyone, because in those days, stars had reps and unknowns weren't supposed to be able to talk like Hayes, who would use lyrics from popular songs in his interviews, let alone work like Gordy. While the Freebirds take credit, and perhaps they should, for entrance music, a staple of pro wrestling and one of the reasons it became as big an entertainment form years later, they were not the first to do so. Gorgeous George in the 50s came out to pomp and circumstance, but as big as George got, it never caught on with the other wrestlers. Leroy Rochester in the 70s took on the name Bad, Bad Leroy Brown, from a hit song by Jim Croce at about the same time. Junkyard Dog soon followed, after Watt saw the success of the Freebirds with the music in Louisiana, coming out to another one bites the dust. This was all before the Freebirds arrived in Atlanta and put entrance music on the map for good when they showed up on WTCG in the fall of 1980 for the entire country to see. The first Freebird interview at the WMC TV studios, and match where the two face the top two local babyfaces, Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee, is one of those tape collectors classics of the era. Hayes, quoting from popular music, said the two were the hot childs of the city. He does run wild. And I do look pretty. Hayes then 18, was already doing the strut he'd become famous for. By this time Gordy 16, had improved immensely in the ring, doing amazing bumps reminiscent of the likes of a Ric Flair, and blowing nearly everyone in the territory away with his work. Their two of three fall first television match was memorable, because it was the debut of them under the name The Fabulous Freebirds, and also because during the second fall on live television, hey shit in his pants, literally. He had to run to the rest room during the television commercial break between falls, the Freebirds were booked as the number two heel team, however, behind Wayne Ferris, later known as Honky Tonk Man, and Larry Latham, later known as Moon Dog Spot, known then as the Blonde Bombers, even though the Freebirds were already far better in the ring and often stole the shows. Soon the fans were cheering them and Jarrett decided to turn them babyface. I'll never forget the look on Lawler's face, Hayes said. The entire place was standing, 
when they came down the aisle at the Coliseum and the music played. When they got to television the next Saturday came word that they were being turned back heel. Eddie Marlin and Bill Dundee told them that Jarrett saw the tape and thought they hadn't gotten over big enough so was switching them back. Lawler then came in with a different story, saying they had gotten over so huge, that Jarrett decided to turn them heel for a top program. They knew management was lying to them in some form, which led to their decision to leave for Mid-South. After Mid-South, they showed up on Georgia Championship Wrestling, the top-rated cable show in the nation, in September of 1980 as a three-man team with the idea that any two of the three could wrestle, although in most cases it was Gordy and Roberts. It was almost always Gordy and someone, they were immediately put on top, winning the tag team titles in a three-way over the area's top heel team of the 60s, the Masked Assassins, although these weren't the same famous duo, Jody Hamilton was the same, but his new partner was Roger Smith, and the area's all-time top babyface team, Mr. Wrestling, Tim Wooden, and Mr. Wrestling 2, Johnny Walker. Things started out well, even though Anderson didn't quite understand the music and the ring outfits, but let them do it, and they got over remarkably fast. They were in main events in weeks, champs within a month, and in less than two months Gordy was in a singles main event at the Omni against Jack Briscoe. But then Anderson quit as Booker and was replaced by Robert Fuller who, when it came to logic, was a far cry from either Anderson or Watts. The territory was going down fast with the Freebirds on top feuding with Fuller, Ted DiBiase and 6'9", 430-pound Stan Frazier, a hideous worker and a name that most involved roll their eyes when talking about. After Fuller was gone, and replaced by Robley, they started to recreate old Mid-South angles that had drawn big money. While not the success they were in Louisiana since Junkyard Dog wasn't as over as a babyface in Georgia, they did turn things around somewhat. The most famous angle of that time wasn't a recreation, and it's one that probably everyone who saw it likely still remembers due to its dramatic nature. In a televised tag match against DiBiase and Junkyard Dog, Gordy Pyle drove DiBiase on the floor. In those days, that was an angle and a stretcher job all by itself. But DiBiase, who was being pushed as the super babyface because they were grooming him for the NWA title, which he never got but that's another story, somehow got up, and rolled into the ring. He then kicked out of the pin, which nobody at the time expected, and the shock of it not being the finish, made the angle. After two more pile drivers in the ring, DiBiase bit a condom he'd kept in his mouth filled with blood, which made it appear he was internally bleeding as the blood came out of his mouth. They did the stretcher job, and to give it authenticity, DiBiase went to the hospital, working everyone at the hospital that the angle was real and his neck was badly injured. Announcer Gordon Soley gave the name of the hospital DiBiase had been rushed to, lending authenticity. The hospital was flooded with phone calls from all over the country. Those who called were, in fact, told, because the hospital employees knew no better, that DiBiase really was in the hospital with a severe neck injury. DiBiase worked the hospital employees for a week regarding neck pain and spent the week in bed, filled with morphine, before getting released. Several weeks later, he returned to a big pop on television, and the feud was back on. They also retold the story of what is to this day the biggest angle ever in New Orleans, when Hayes used the famous secret Freebird cream, that'll take people back a few decades to a time when the Freebirds debuted catchphrases in interviews, except they didn't have a term then talking about growing up on Bad Street, USA. The further down the block he went the better it got, and we lived in the last house on the right. The drug-induced exploits on the so-called Free Bird Mountain believed to be actually Lookout Mountain in Georgia, and so many others, to blind Jid, with the idea he was blind the day his first daughter was born. The angle which was blown off before nearly 30,000 fans at the Superdome, is a figure that to this day has never been equaled in that city. The Freebirds, like the Road Warriors of a few years later, because of the music and the charisma, ended up being half babyfaces in Atlanta, where to most of the crowd, particularly the older audience, they were the top heels. But to a lot of males 15 to 25, due to the song and the attitude, they were already getting cheered. They dominated the tag team scene in Georgia through the summer of 1981. Instead of turning face as a trio, Roberts left and Hayes and Gordy split. Hayes went babyface for a tag team feud, with Hayes first teaming with Kevin Von Erich, as irony would have it, and later with former Oakland Raiders star Otis Sistring, who only lasted a few weeks before finding wrestling wasn't to his liking, against Gordy with new partner Jimmy Snuka. There was the scene when Jose LeDuc was doing a feat of strength, where they put the brick on his head and broke it with a sledgehammer. Gordy told kids that he thinks they should all try something like that at home, causing Soli to legitimately freak out. Gordy, and eventually Hayes, left for Southeastern Championship Wrestling, continuing their feud from national TV.
Having been there long enough, Hayes felt it was time for him to return to Atlanta, and gave notice. In his last match in the territory, Gordy beat Hayes in a hair versus hair match in a cage. Gordy wanted to go to a territory where he could be the top single star, and Hayes was just happy being able to spend three nights a week at home in Pensacola for the first time in years. They thought it was time to get off national television before they burned out, but knew after a rest, they had to return. As the group of heels led by the Duke and the Sheepherders, were giving the beaten Hayes a beating after he had lost and before cutting his hair, Gordy snapped, saved his former partner from the haircut, and turned himself babyface. A short time later, when Hayes was attacked on Atlanta TV by Buzz Sawyer and Kevin Sullivan, Gordy returned to make the save, and the tape from Alabama of them getting back together was shown nationally. The team was back together, as full-fledged babyfaces on national TV. While the angle in Alabama with Gordy's turn was a classic, it was all more coincidence than something well planned out. The return to Atlanta didn't last long, as Hayes and Anderson had their problems and Hayes was fired, or quit, as they both sort of happened simultaneously. It was announced on television a few days later that he had suffered a broken leg, to send him the message that he couldn't come back anytime soon. Next stop was Dallas. At the time Dallas was a struggling territory. While it had some huge peaks earlier on and was a wrestling hotbed in the early 70s, Fritz von Erich, promoter Jack Adkisson, had retired a few months earlier at a show at Texas Stadium which only drew 6,000 fans. The promotion was really just designed by Fritz to be a vehicle to make stars and eventually NWA world champions out of his three sons, who had become very popular with teenagers. But their big crowds were usually limited to appearances by Ric Flair as world champion defending against one of the sons. The Freebirds had met Gary Hart, Gary Williams, the Dallas Booker at the time, when he would come to Atlanta for television and big shows with a great kabuki, Akihi Samara, who feuded with Dusty Rhodes. At the time Dallas wasn't the place you went to, either to further your career or to make money, and Hayes was only planning on going for a week or two before venturing to a big money territory. But he was there when they had a big show with Flair in San Antonio, and the kids challenging Flair always did business. Hayes smelled something, called up Gordy that night, and told him to give his notice in Atlanta. Hayes and Gordy actually arrived as baby faces, with the story being that they had befriended David, the wildest of the brothers, when David wrestled in Georgia, David actually never wrestled in Georgia, and Kevin actually was Hayes' tag partner for a few weeks in Atlanta. At the time the Freebirds having been successful draws in much hotter territories and coming off national exposure, were seen as far too big stars for an office that wasn't doing much business. In one of those rare nights where wrestling history changed, December 25, 1982, Flair and Kerry Von Erich wrestled before 12,000 fans, the largest crowd to witness wrestling in that part of the country since Fritz Glory days against the likes of Dory Funk Jr., in a cage match at Reunion Arena for the NWA title, with Hayes as referee, voted on by the fans since referee problems in the past had cost Kerry an earlier title match with Flair. Gordy was appointed by Hayes to watch the door to keep any heels from interfering. Earlier in the show, the promotion created the world's six-man titles, which over the next few years, became the biggest drawing belt in the territory and among the hottest titles in all of wrestling. It was and still remains the only time in a major American promotion where the six-man titles were a bigger drawing title than either the main singles or tag team titles, largely due to the rivalry. The Freebirds, with Roberts returning, were scheduled against champs Bill Irwin and Great Kabuki and the Mongol. To make the story even better, Roberts missed the show due to a plane delay. David, being their friends from Georgia, volunteered to take his place, actually scored the winning fall, and then announced he was giving Roberts the third belt since he figured if the situation was reversed, that would be the right thing to do. In one of the classic matches of the 80s, both for ring work, and more for turning a territory around in one night Kerry had the match won but Hayes suddenly started subtlety healing his ref. Finally, Gordy slammed the cage door on Kerry's head, causing him to lose and Freebirds vs. Von Eriks was born. It was the right program to turn around a territory at the right time. Five guys ranging in age from 22 to 25, all charismatic in their own way, and veteran Roberts, an established ring general whose own fondness for the bottle did little to teach a more calm demeanor to his younger brothers. World class, built around this program and with production values of television, a six-camera shoot, something never done before in wrestling, started syndicating the show nationally, and even internationally, and it was a particular hit in the Middle East. With the Freebirds as such great heels introducing vignettes, the idea of Keith Mitchell and Dan Bynum, to the world of pro wrestling, such as where they'd be in public with announcer Bill Mercer and be wise asses such as going to drive through windows at fast food places and not paying, or going places and sticking Mercer with the check.
It changed television wrestling forever. It was no longer a typical low-rent wrestling TV show, but a well-produced television show, ironically syndicated by the Christian Broadcasting Network. The Von Erichs did a big Christian gimmick, where wrestling was the product. The Von Erichs became three of the hottest babyfaces in wrestling, just as the junkyard dog did years earlier, due to having the right hill opposition. While several territories caught fire in 1983 which was a huge year nationwide for the business, one year before Vince McMahon went national with the WWF, World Class had the hottest program of them all. Various mixes of the feud were drawing 4,500 people every Friday night in Dallas at the decrepit Sportatorium, and the big shows, called Star Wars, were now selling out Reunion Arena's 18,000 seats. Suddenly David passed away in Japan from a drug overdose, but the territory was so hot, they introduced Mike Von Erich as a replacement. The 19-year-old some would say was the single least credible main eventer of the time, as he was rushed into the hottest programs in wrestling. Gordy and Roberts were so good as workers that they somehow got Mike over, and the territory didn't miss a beat. It peaked on May 6, 1984 when, underneath the famous carry title win over Flair in David's honor, Fritz and Mike and Kevin beat the Freebirds in a bad street match for the six-man titles before 32,123 fans paying $402,000. At the time the second largest live gate in the history of North American pro wrestling, at Texas Stadium, one of the largest crowds in the history of pro wrestling until that point in time. Gordy had debuted for All Japan in August of 1983 when Bruiser Brody saw his potential working several matches against him in Texas, most notably the tag match, Hayes and Gordy losing the American tag titles to Brody and Kerry, on June 17, 1983 at Reunion Arena. Brody recommended him to Giant Baba after working with him on the show which drew 18,000 fans as the co-feature with the Flair vs. Kevin headliner. It was the building's first pro wrestling sellout and nearly doubling the previous state record gate set for the Christmas show just six months earlier. His first tour put him on the map in the biggest match in the promotion in several years, as the designated guy to do the job for Terry Funk's retirement match as Stan Hansen's tag team partner. He did so well that Japan ended up being his wrestling home for most of the next decade. Days before he was supposed to go for what may have been the highest profile match of his career, Gordy wanted to cancel, saying he didn't want to go to Japan or fly that far. Hayes had to talk him into going at the last minute. Gordy on occasion used the move now known as the power bomb as a pile driver like finish in the United States, although it didn't have a name. He debuted it on August 25, 1983 in Japan against Genichiro Tenryu, and it got over so big it eventually became his trademark, and become by the late 80s, a hot finishing move in Japan. His success in Japan ultimately broke up the original Freebird team. Hayes in 1989 reformed a Freebird team in WCW with Jimmy Garvin and managers Diamond Dallas Page and Humperdinck, a pairing most Freebird fans of the 80s would choose to forget. He went from being a guy scared to go out on his own, to Japan, to a guy who flourished on his own, Hayes said. We would never want to stop another from achieving success, when Vince McMahon went national in 1984 and tried to lock up the most marketable talent in the country to run against the established regional offices, the Freebirds would seemingly be high on his list of people to take. It's a forgotten chapter in wrestling history. Hayes who already produced a music video with the help of the crack production crew in Dallas, went to the WWF to become a rock star under the tutelage of Cindy Lauper's manager, David Wolf. McMahon's idea was to create a rock band that would wrestle, and Hayes, with his love for music and his charisma in wrestling, was the most obvious choice. To say this was a flop would be an understatement. As wild as the wrestlers of that era were, they weren't ready for the Freebirds, who only lasted a few weeks. Gordy at the same time got a nearly full-time offer from Giant Baba, and was gone. We were young and cocky and it was a culture shock, remembered Hayes of the short-lived and forgotten stay. It was the typical WWF attitude. The Freebirds, coming off their success, felt they had nothing to prove going to the WWF as they were already stars. The WWF attitude was that what was done elsewhere didn't count. We didn't like it, Hayes recalled. Terry and Buddy really didn't like it. Dallas had already peaked. Same people for too long. It was really only designed as a promotional vehicle for the kids, and with the same baby faces, and many of the same heels running every Monday and Friday in the same metropolitan area, the territory never regained its 1983-84 peak. Freebirds did their face turns, turns on each other, getting back together again for more Freebirds versus Von Erichs, but the glory days were over. They went to Florida when Eddie Graham gave Hayes the book, but then Graham committed suicide and the territory wasn't doing business. They had a run in the AWA which led to a pretty 
Hot drawing program with the Road Warriors including a Comiskey Park show in Chicago that drew more than 20,000 fans, but Freebirds and Vern Gagne ultimately mixed like oil and water and the stay was short-lived. We drove everyone crazy, Hayes said. We even drove ourselves crazy. The Freebirds suggested doing the natural program with the Road Warriors, since they were, along with the Von Eriks, probably the most established main event tag teams in the business at the time. Vern Gagne was against it, thinking the Road Warriors were heels, even though almost all the fans were cheering them at the time. But the Freebirds programs with the other AWA babyfaces, whose heat was almost all killed by the Road Warriors, as heels not selling for the other faces, were cold and they hated the weather and got out. They ended up back in Texas, when Watts decided to follow the lead of McMahon and Jim Crockett and go national, particularly expanding into Texas, he and Booker Ken Lusk launched a full-scale raid of the Von Erich territory, taking many of the top stars, including the Freebirds, with popular valet sunshine Valerie French as their manager. Lawsuits followed, but ultimately, the economy in Watts' territory was weak and wrestling was past its peak. Going national proved to be too expensive. For whatever reason, probably having worked too long in the same general part of the country and no longer being a fresh act, the Freebirds' drawing power wasn't there this time, although they had numerous great matches. By this point Gordy was considered one of the best in-ring performers in the business, and when Watts chose his first world champion to base his national company around, Gordy got the nod, beating top face Jim Duggan in the finals of a hot tournament on May 30, 1986 in Houston. Gordy was a tremendous champion in the ring, with classic matches against Duggan, Steve Williams, Ted DiBiase, Terry Taylor and others. At one point, when wrestling started changing and fans were losing patience with slow building matches, Watts decided to fight the tide, ordering DiBiase, his best pure worker, and Gordy to do 55 minutes matches in every city, making the fans believe they were going to see the old 60 minutes Broadway. And then, when they were sure that was the finish, having Gordy use hill tactics to score a pinfall. The matches were classics, but the cost of signing all that talent, combined with weak gates partially due to a lack of fresh talent and also because the home base was hit hard by a recession due to the collapse of the oil business, and an expensive national syndication network which was costing big money in the major markets to maintain, and wasn't generating enough ad revenue, it wasn't a winning formula. Going with Gordy as champion for most promoters was a decision they wouldn't have made because his Japanese commitment saw him frequently leave. With three of his top wrestlers, Gordy, Williams and DiBiase all having heavy and lucrative Japanese deals, it was getting harder to build momentum of championship programs. There were just so many injury angles you could do with DiBiase and Williams before it started to get out of hand. Gordy ended up being injured legitimately in an auto accident that November, but was going to end up losing the title anyway, since Watts had a big Superdome show on Thanksgiving and Gordy was booked in Baba's tag team tournament, with former Dallas rival Killer Khan, he of the famous Battle of the Oriental Spike bloodbaths. At the same time, the injury forced Gordy to forfeit the title to one man gang at a time when Watts decided to move the heat from what he felt were the more immature Freebirds to the more solid crew led by Skander Akbar, though they were more professional, totally lacked charisma, and the territory went down the tubes. In early 1987, Watts sold the Universal Wrestling Federation to Jim Crockett. For the most part, the original Freebirds were finished. When DBSE signed with WWF to become the million dollar man, Gordy got his spot as Hansen's regular tag team partner including winning the 1988 Real World Tag League Tournament over Genichiro Tenryu and Toshiaki Kawada in the match which made Kawada a superstar. Tenryu was injured and Kawada was by himself for several minutes against both the company's top foreigners, kicking out of one big move after another, before finally losing in one of the all-time classic matches. His final big run in Texas took place one year earlier, the controversial angle on December 25, 1987 five years to the day of them doing the angle setting the company on fire. By this point both David and Mike Von Erich had passed away, and an angle was shot where Gordy, Roberts, and King Parsons, known as the Blackbirds, turned on Fritz, then 59, and pounded on him until Fritz faked a heart attack and for the next several weeks, depending largely on the gate the previous Friday, pretended to be near either getting better after a sellout or near death, when the houses started to drop. Even people in wrestling, who already had some major latitude when it came to angles, were repulsed by Fritz playing off the deaths of his two children for what was the last angle that actually drew money for the family as Kevin and Kerry went for revenge in early 1988. But Dallas was by this point just a stop between Japan tours for Gordy. In 1990 Baba, attempting to duplicate the success of the Hanson and Brody tag team of 1982-85, tried to recreate it with Gordy and Williams. Williams at the time was one of New Japan's top foreigners, 
Baba signed him as a regular through New Japan in a deal when, for a brief period, both sides worked together. From the start, Baba wanted to build the tag team division around them and in their first major match on March 6, 1990 at Budokan Hall, they defeated the company's top foreign star, Hansen, and top native star, Tenri Yu, to win the world tag team titles. They dominated the belts for the next three years, including in 1990 and 1991 becoming the first tag team to win back-to-back -back real world tag league tournament victories. Although not quite the force inside the ring he had been before the knee problems, Gordy at the time was still probably the best big man inside the ring in the business. He was being groomed for the top position in All Japan with the aging Hansen being moved to that veteran gunslinger position, and toward that end, twice held the Triple Crown in 1990. He first won it from Jumbo Tsurida on June 5th in Chiba, just for a short run to heat up his feud with Hansen, who won the title three days later at Budokan Hall before 14,800 fans. The feud was designed to make fans see the younger Gordy as Hansen's equal while still protecting Hansen's legend, as Gordy was put on the same plane as Hansen six weeks later winning the Triple Crown on June 17, 1990 in Kanazawa in 2104. At the time this was one of the few times up to that point in the 13 years he had been the most popular foreign wrestler in Japan that Hansen had done a clean job for another foreigner. It was a transition period for all Japan, with Misawa replacing Surita as the focal point of the company with Surita taking the old native gunslinger role that Baba took years earlier when Surita was made the regular main event native, and similarly, Gordy, from the same generation, would take the focal role on the foreigner side from Hansen, with the idea Misawa vs. Gordy would be the legendary singles program of the 90s. But shortly after the win, while partying at Ropongi, a hot nightlife part of Tokyo, he collapsed at a club, suffering from a major overdose. His heart stopped beating. He was revived, survived, and returned to the ring on the next tour with no discernible damage, but unfortunately, the scare didn't teach him the lesson it was should have as his lifestyle never changed. Baba stripped him of the title and he nearly lost his job in the process. Drugs, both painkillers and otherwise were commonplace by this point among the foreigners in Japan, both to combat being in Japan for a month straight at times, as well as the pain from the matches. However, Baba, the beloved father figure and boss, came from another era and had little tolerance for them, or at least had adopted a see-no-evil attitude. The overdose forced Baba to have to see the issue, and it took a lot of pleading for him to allow Gordy back. But he never gave him the triple crown again, and never even allowed him to challenge for it until three years later, ironically, in a match that would never take place. Gordy and Williams were together only three years, but their total time holding the world tag team titles was longer than all but nine teams in the history of pro wrestling. In Japan, they had classic battles with all the top tag teams of that hot era, including Hansen and Tenryu, Hansen and Danny Spivey, Misawa, and Kawada the Funks, Giant Baba and Andre the Giant, Jumbo Surida, Ayashiaki Yansu Surida, and Kabuki Surida and Akira Tawe, Doug Furness and Dan Crawford, Kawada and Tawe, Misawa and Kobashi and Hansen and Gary Albright. This was during the period when All Japan hit one of its hot periods, ironically during a period when many thought the company would be crippled. Tenryu, who was the biggest star in the company at the time, quit, taking several veterans with them. The company was forced to make stars out of some of the younger wrestlers, who by Japanese tradition, would likely have had to have waited years of patience for their turn. The most experienced of the younger wrestlers was Tiger Mask, who they had unmasked as Misawa, and he suddenly caught fire, combined with strong pushes for Kobashi, Kawada, Tawei and others. Later when Jun Akiyama debuted, he was pushed from the start. Business caught fire when Misawa first got over as a main eventer. Soon it goes so hot they starting selling out all tickets from rabid fans who would sell out Budokan as soon as tickets were put on sale at the show before. Gordy and Williams' first tag tournament win in 1990 came with a spectacular finish, when Williams, for the first time in his career, pinned Hansen, tag match against Hansen and Spivey, in 29-59 with the Oklahoma Stampede. The booking got them over huge, because Hansen and Spivey had more points going into the finals, a 30 minutes time limit match and only needed to draw, which everyone expected when just a few minutes were left, to win the tournament. To relieve the pressure on his bad knees, Gordy trimmed down, getting as light as 245 pounds in 1991, which looked positively skinny on his broad frame. As drawing cards at the team peaked during the 1991 tournament, setting television ratings records that still stand in Japan on successive weeks in December of that year, in the 12.30 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. Sunday night time slot, Gordy and Williams' match with Hansen and Spivey was the main event on a show which drew a 7.0 rating, the largest rating in the history of that time slot in Japan. The record lasted only one week, 
as the tournament final, where they beat Misawa and Kawada, drew an 8.2. Part of this record was also because that was the Dynamite Kid retirement ceremony, both weeks doing better than a 75 audience share. What's even brought them back to WCW in 1992, where they held both the WCW and newly created NWA World Tag Team titles working programs with both the Steiner brothers, which was an intriguing feud for Japan since the Steiners were top draws for New Japan while Gordy and Williams were the top foreigners for All Japan, and Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham, but ultimately their stay was short due to Japan commitments and neither wanting to give up what in those days was considered one of the prime jobs in wrestling. That was Gordy's peak earning years, working 26 weeks for Baba at nearly $10,000 per week, plus another $200,000 WCW deal that Jim Ross and Watts put together for them. They held the All Japan World Tag Team titles five times over three years, including also holding both the NWA and WCW tag titles in the United States in 1992. They would have likely remained the dominant foreign team in All Japan for the rest of the decade. Terry Gordy, pro wrestling superstar, ended on August 18, 1993. At the age of 32, while flying to Japan for a tour, which was to climax with a show at Budokan Hall a few weeks later where he would finally be allowed to main event on his own, challenging Misawa for the Triple Crown on a show that was already sold out. He took 50 somas on the flight. It was generally a known rule that Gordy would come to Japan two days before the tour started, and get so loaded on the long flight, that he'd spend a day sleeping it off in his Tokyo hotel room on arrival, and the wrestlers and his friends knew to just let him be but this time when the plane landed, he was out, and turning blue. While on the plane nobody reacted because he was always like that on the trip over. But this time he wasn't sleeping, he was in a coma. When they couldn't awaken him, EMTs got on the plane to perform CPR to attempt to revive him and at one point, once again, his heart stopped beating and his brain stopped functioning. He was rushed to the hospital and remained in a coma for five days. He was never the same. That was a self-induced problem, Hayes said. I don't know if he didn't understand the success or couldn't handle the success. The overdose left him brain damaged and robbed him of his athletic ability. He had to relearn to talk, then relearn to walk, and eventually even relearn to wrestle, up to a point. He could no longer perform at a top level, but he still had a name and bills to pay and he only knew one thing. He returned to wrestling several months later. He returned to wrestling in the dying days of the Global Wrestling Federation in Texas, joining Hayes and Jimmy Garvin as the Freebirds. With no advertising, advanced publicity, fanfare or pressure, Bala brought him in for a series of mid-card matches starting with the 7th annual Bruiser Brody Memorial Show on July 16, 1994 in Nagasaki for a short run, but it was not a success. After finishing the tour on July 28, 1994 at Budokan Hall, he was never brought back to all Japan. Over the past six years he continued to wrestle, as a shadow of himself, mainly working small independent shows in the South or for the IWA in Japan, who tried to use the famous Terry Gordy name from his glory days on network television to sell tickets and booked him strong. As the 757 fans, and brief forays as champion promotions on their last legs like the GWF in Dallas and Smoky Mountain Wrestling in Tennessee, desperate that his name might briefly inject some life into their sagging box office. He had later brief runs in ECW and finally, WWF, under a mask as fully short-lived tag team partner. I suppose if he hadn't have survived he'd have been James Dean. Instead, he was Jan of Jan and Dean. People who knew his name and then saw him perform during this period, mainly were left feeling sad, remembering just how good he once was. Hay said the last few years of Gordy's life were very tough on him. He said Gordy lost a lot of his drive when he realized he couldn't come all the way back. In his mind, I think it really bothered him that he'd never be that Terry Gordy again. It was only eight years ago. But in this industry, that's several lifetimes. Just as fans today don't even know that Michael Hayes was ever a famous wrestler, years ago when the new generation of wrestlers in the WWF dressing room would ask, incredulously, you mean Doke, Hendrix, Hayes' former name as a WWF announcer, used to wrestle? The older wrestlers who knew what the Freebirds were in pro wrestling or even the other younger wrestlers who grew up on Georgia or Texas wrestling, had to either cringe or try to hold their temper. But obviously that means Terry Gordy and the exploits of the Freebirds are long forgotten in a world which has no history other than what happens to fit in with the current storyline, aside from their near miss last year in the Hall of Fame balloting. Maybe that's good, because nobody remembers the masked executioner and Undertaker brawl outside that building five years ago as Undertaker thought he was working a program with the legendary Terry Gordy, only to find out by this time Terry Gordy was just a name.
like Dynamite Kid, so many of the great performers pushed themselves so hard, at both ends of the candle, which led to a physical explosion. Aside from the memories of fans from that time period, when the story was over, Dynamite Kid came to Calgary with $20 in his pocket. He returned home to England for the last time almost two decades later after being one of the greatest in-ring performers of all time, leaving remnants of his crippled body in rings around the world. Financially, he had broken even. With all the success he had early in life, Gordy left his family with little, and had no life insurance. More than 300 people attended Gordy's funeral in Rossville, Georgia on July 19. Lots of indie wrestlers. Hayes was there, of course. Roberts was at the wake the night before. Other stars of the same era like Terry Taylor, Tommy Rich, Tony Anthony, whose name as the Dirty White Boy was actually something Gordy came up with for himself in Alabama, Doug Gilbert and Robert Gibson, as well as Barry Buchanan of the WWF, attended along with a slew of local independent wrestlers who saw Gordy as the one wrestler out of Chattanooga who for a period of time was, no matter how the story ended, he was a local legend in the ring. Minister Richard Hutchison talked about how everyone in town used to watch Terry Gordy on Saturdays at 6 p.m., Georgia Championship Wrestling. He talked about how tough this must be on Hayes, who was with Gordy's family. Gordy was shown in an open casket, and even with a heavy makeup, they weren't able to cover up his massive gig marks from two decades of blade jobs as one of his other noted talents in the ring, as seems to be the case with a lot of wrestlers who were heavy drinkers, is he was a tremendous bleeder. He left behind three children from a previous marriage, a son Terry Ray Jr., the same Ray who was the subject of a 1981 angle where Hayes, by this point a babyface, gave Gordy's son a present which Gordy destroyed on Atlanta TV, attempting to follow in his father's big footsteps wrestling in Japan and two young girls. The song Free Bird played at the service. Behind the casket in the chapel was a giant wreath of white flowers, with red flowers that also spelled out Free Bird with two small rebel flags. Hayes missed one of his weekly syndicated announcing gigs for the funeral, but did the other and briefly mentioned Gordy, which was the only WWF mention of him, and thanked people who had sent him their condolences during the week. He will come out of retirement to fulfill Gordy's final wrestling commitment on August 11th for a Southeastern Wrestling Reunion show in Birmingham by teaming with Gordy's son in a show billed as last one for the road, a tribute to free bird Terry Gordy. While the last few years for him was sad, being unable to perform at anywhere near the level he used to or live up to the name, or have the fans see him as the same person, his final experience in wrestling apparently wasn't. As noted last week, Gordy came to the WWF SmackDown tapings in Birmingham just six days before he died. The WWF had run many major shows in the Birmingham market over the last few years, and he never attended any of them. In the last year, mentally, he'd made great improvements. His eyes were clear and he was totally coherent. Many of the biggest names in wrestling, including the McMahon family and The Undertaker, Dudleys, Rob Van Dam, Big Show, Jim Ross, Gerald Briscoe and others came up to him and told him that they remembered what he'd accomplished. Some of the younger wrestlers who grew up watching him told him what an honor it was to meet him. When we left the building, Terry told me he would never go to another show like that, said longtime friend Michael Holt, who came to the show with him. God knew this was it, said Hayes. I'm just glad he had that day. Terry Gordy Career Title History Source, Wrestling Title History's 3rd Edition and Wrestling Observer Newsletter Records all Japan Triple Crown defeated Jumbo Tsurta June 5, 1990 Chiba lost to Stan Hansen June 8, 1990 Tokyo, defeated Stan Hansen July 17, 1990 Ishikawa, title vacated when Gordy missed title defense due to overdose. Universal Wrestling Federation Heavyweight, 1. Tournament to create first champion over Jim Duggan May 30, 1986 Houston, title vacated when Gordy was injured in an auto accident November 19, 1986. All Japan Double World Tag Team but Stan Hansen defeated Jumbo Tsurita and Yoshiaki Yatsu July 29, 1988 Takasaki, lost to Jumbo Tsurita and Yoshiaki Yatsu July 31, 1988 Hakodate, with Stan Hansen won vacant title in annual World Tag League Tournament defeated Genichiro Tenryu and Toshiaki Kaoda December 13, 1988 Tokyo, lost to Jumbo Tsurita and Yoshiaki Yatsu February 2, 1989 Kansas City, with Steve Williams defeated Stan Hansen and Genichiro Tenryu March 6, 1990 Tokyo, lost to Jumbo Tsurita and Great Kabuki July 19, 1990 Tokyo, with Steve Williams won vacant title in annual World Tag League Tournament defeated Stan Hansen and Danny Spivey December 7, 1990 Tokyo, 
lost to Stan Hansen and Danny Spivey April 18, 1991 Tokyo, Steve Williams defeated Stan Hansen and Danny Spivey June 6, 1991 Yokosuka, lost to Mitsuharu Masao and Toshiaki Kawada July 24, 1991 Kanazawa, with Steve Williams one vacant title in annual World Tag League Tournament defeated Mitsuharu Masawa and Toshiaki Kawada. December 6, 1991, lost to Jumbo Tsurida and Akira Tawe March 4, 1992 Tokyo, with Steve Williams defeated Mitsuharu Misawa and Toshiaki Kawada January 30, 1993 Chiba, lost to Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tawe May 20, 1993 Sapporo. WCW World Tag Team with Steve Williams defeated Rick and Scott Steiner July 5, 1992 Atlanta, lost to Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham September 21, 1992 Atlanta. NWA World Tag Team, with Steve Williams one tournament final to create champions defeated Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham July 16, 1992 Albany, Georgia, lost to Dustin Rhodes and Barry Windham September 21, 1992 Atlanta. NWA American Heavyweight, defeated Kevin Von Erich January 21, 1983 Dallas, lost to Kevin Von Erich March 4, 1983 Dallas. World Class Six-Man Tag Team, with David Von Erich and Michael Hayes defeated Bill Irwin and Great Kabuki and the Mongol, Gene Pettit, December 25, 1982 Dallas, David Von Erich vacated title to Buddy Roberts after the match, lost to Kevin and Kerry and David Von Erich July 4, 1983 Fort Worth, with Michael Hayes and Buddy Roberts defeated Kevin and Kerry and David Von Erich August 12, 1983 Dallas, lost to Kevin and Kerry and David Von Erich December 2, 1983 Dallas, with Michael Hayes and Buddy Roberts defeated Kevin and Kerry and David Von Erich in fictitious match in Georgia, lost to Fritz and Kevin and Mike Von Erich May 6, 1984 Irving, Texas, defeated Kevin and Kerry and Mike Von Erich July 4, 1984 Fort Worth, lost to Kevin and Kerry and Mike Von Erich September 3, 1984 Fort Worth, defeated Kevin and Kerry Von Erich and Brian Adias January 3, 1986 Dallas, lost to Kevin and Kerry and Lance Von Erich May 4, 1986 Irving, Texas, with Buddy Roberts and King Parsons defeated Steve Simpson and Chris Adams and Matt Bourne January 4, 1988 Dallas, Forty vacated his third of title leaving for Japan. NWA National Tag Team, with Buddy Roberts, and sometimes Michael Hayes, defeated Robert Fuller and Stan Frazier in traditional Thanksgiving Tag Team Tournament Final November 27, 1980 Atlanta to become first champions, lost to Ted DiBiase and Stan Frazier January 26, 1981 Augusta, Georgia, with Buddy Roberts, and sometimes Michael Hayes, defeated Ted DiBiase and Stan Frazier January 31, 1981 Atlanta, lost to Ted DiBiase and Steve Olsonowski June 10, 1981 Marietta, Georgia, with Jimmy Snuka defeated Ted DiBiase and Steve Olsonowski July 6, 1981 Augusta, Georgia, lost to Michael Hayes and Otis Sistring September 27, 1981 Atlanta, with Michael Hayes defeated Super Destroyer and John Studd July 2, 1982 Chattanooga, lost to Afa and Siga August 29, 1982 Atlanta. NWA Georgia Tag Team, with Buddy Roberts and sometimes Michael Hayes won three-team tournament over Mr. Wrestling 1 and 2 in the Masked Assassins October 10, 1980 Atlanta, titles held up after match with Kevin Sullivan and Austin Idol November 14, 1980 Atlanta. Mid-South Tag Team, with Michael Hayes defeated Bill Watson Buck Robley November 24, 1979 Shreveport, lost to Junkyard Dog and Buck Robley April 6, 1980 Monroe, Louisiana, with Buddy Roberts defeated Junkyard Dog and Buck Robley June 9, 1980 New Orleans, lost to Junkyard Dog and Terry Orndorff September 1980. NWA American Tag Team, with Michael Hayes defeated Bill Irwin and King Kong Bundy November 26, 1982 Dallas, lost to Kerry Von Eric and Bruiser Brody June 17, 1983 Dallas. Mid-South Louisiana Heavyweight defeated Junkyard Dog May 2, 1980 Shreveport, lost to Junkyard Dog 1980. NWA Mid-American Tag Team, with Michael Hayes defeated George Gulas and Bobby Eaton January 7, 1979 Chattanooga, lost to Bobby Eaton and Mexican Angel February 1979, with Michael Hayes defeated Bobby Eaton and Mexican Angel February 1979, lost to Gypsy Joe and Tom Renisto Jr. July 4, 1979 Nashville. Global Wrestling Tag Team With Jimmy Garvin defeated Black Bart and John Hawk, Bradshaw, June 3, 1994 Dallas, promotion folded in September. NWA Southeastern Heavyweight, defeated Jos Leduc 1982. Dothan, Alabama, lost to Jos Leduc 1982. NWA Alabama Heavyweight, defeated Jimmy Golden 1982, lost to Jos Leduc May 1982. Mississippi Heavyweight, held title in 1978, lost to Dr. X July 1978. Smoky Mountain Heavyweight, 
one title in tag match with Thrasher over champ Brad Armstrong and Wolfman October 20, 1995 Knoxville, lost to Brad Armstrong November 23, 1995 Knoxville. Champion Carnival Tournament Record 1992 Fourth place behind Stan Hansen, Mitsuharu Misawa and Jumbo Tsurita, 1993, tied for third behind Stan Hansen and Mitsuharu Misawa. Real World Tag League Tournament History 1986, with Killer Khan, 5th 1987, with Stan Hansen, tied for second behind Jumbo Tsurita and Yoshiaki Yatsu 1988, with Stan Hansen defeated Genichiro Tenryu and Toshiaki Kawada to win, 1989, with Bill Irwin 7th 1990, with Steve Williams defeated Stan Hansen and Danny Spivey to win 1991, with Steve Williams defeated Mitsuharu Misawa and Toshiaki Kawada to win. 1992, with Steve Williams, tied for second behind Mitsuharu Misawa and Toshiaki Kawada Wrestling Observer Newsletter Awards Tag Team of the Year. 1980, with Buddy Roberts 1981, with Jimmy Snuka 1992, with Steve Williams. Best Brawler 1986 Winner Match of the Year 1984, with Michael Hayes and Buddy Roberts vs. Kevin and Kerry and Mike Von Eric July 4th Fort Worth Feud of the Year 1983, with Michael Hayes and Buddy Roberts vs. Kevin and Kerry and David Von Eric 1984, with Michael Hayes and Buddy Roberts vs. Kevin and Kerry and Mike Von Eric The Reader's Pages Gordy. Your story on Terry Gordy was a beautiful eulogy and quite moving in many ways. I can only hope that with your circulation, those in the business who live only for the moment can see where that road leads. Unfortunately, it is probably naive to think within the wrestling business that the life of Terry Gordy will not have been in vain. Robert Santanzo. I just finished reading the Terry Gordy piece and wanted to echo the sentiments being expressed. The piece was great, and I felt the quotes from Michael Hayes really made it. I was tremendously saddened to once again see that it appears some wrestlers never learned from their mistakes. You would think one near-death experience would wake someone up. But, it appears that this bizarre fantasy world we all love and sometimes despise just puts some of them in a position that they just can't wake up to see the reality of what they are doing to themselves. It's a shame that happened to someone with the talent of Terry Gordy. It also bothered me that, as you have written, wrestling has no history beyond the last few months. It pained me to read that there are actually pro wrestlers who said, what? Doak Hendricks wrestled? It just amazes me. As someone who grew up watching TBS Wrestling and saw a world class on Joe Pettuccino's Superstars of Wrestling show in Atlanta, there was never any doubt whatsoever in my mind that the Freebirds were one of the greatest tag teams of all time. It's a damn shame that today's generation of fans will never know about that or experience that. Pierce Piper. The Terry Gordy obituary was quite a piece of journalism. Terry Gordy seemed like a big kid at heart who knew how to do one thing really well, and had no idea how to control his personal demons. Watching the Freebirds vs. Jerry Lawler and Bill Dundee match, it is hard to believe that Gordy was so young. He seemed so seasoned, and never seemed to get lost, knowing just what to do and when to do it. The Freebirds have to go down as one of the greatest tag teams in history, and I hope they achieve induction into the Hall of Fame. Watching the Ric Flair vs. Kerry Von Erich match where the Freebirds turned is another example of everything working perfectly. It is one of those performances that those who write wrestling today should be forced to watch, so that turns could once again mean something. I'm afraid those days are gone, however. Michael Hayes' performance, his subtle healing until the big payoff was reminiscent of another performance, the Love Machine turn in his mask vs. hair match with Blue Panther. When I read that younger wrestlers are amazed that Doak used to wrestle, I'm shocked and saddened. Does nobody watch old tapes to learn how to work, how to talk and hot to be a wrestler? I can understand not being exposed to it growing up, but I can't understand why wrestlers don't study more tapes to learn their craft. I've watched so many tapes from the 80s, 70s and, and earlier. While some things won't translate to today's audience there seem to always be moves and spots that could be picked up, copied, tweaked and added to a repertoire. You mentioned how many prodigies never live up to their potential in wrestling and baseball. I have to wonder, as impressed as I am by some of the newer wrestlers, will they ever reach their potential? I used to think Jeff Hardy had at least a shot of becoming the next Shawn Michaels. Looking at him today, the Hardys are not appreciably different talent-wise than they were years ago. Could you imagine what several Japanese tours would do for them? It would give them seasoning to go beyond their current style which main eventers need. You're correct when you say Chuck Palumbo and Sean O'Hare should be taken off television and working nightly somewhere without the pressure of national TV. I can't see it happening, though.
The WWF has so many wrestlers under contract, why not take some of the promising young ones and send them to Japan, Mexico, somewhere, where they can work with new and better opponents to become seasoned and well-rounded so when they appear on television again, they're ready to be stars. Just one look at O'Hare's tentative and nervous performances tells you this guy might one day have it, but he sure doesn't now. And if management doesn't do something proactive about it, he never will. Why waste a chance to build for the future? Dan Cirquitella Whether it's the clash of titans in the ring or the drama that unfolds outside it, we're here to break it down, match by match, feud by feud. Remember, in the world of wrestling, every day is a battle, and every victory is a story waiting to be told. Until next time, keep the passion alive, and never stop wrestling with the possibilities. This is the Pro Wrestle Machine.